take a moment to honor those lost on 9-11 and share about a Quinnipiac tradition that Heroes Hat. The Heroes Hat has been awarded for 20 years in honor of Joseph Miscali. Miscali was a firefighter and father of three Quinnipiac alumni, Chris, Jennifer, and Katie Miscali. The hat is presented to the winner of the Quinnipiac vs. Yale men's ice hockey game at Quinnipiac by Mrs. Lori Miscali and her daughter Katie in honor of her fallen husband and father. The Quinnipiac community continues to honor Miscali with this tradition and remembers all of the civilians and first responders who lost their lives and all others impacted by the attacks. Tonight on Sports Pause, the women's soccer team began MAC play against Niagara. The women's field hockey team continued non-conference matchup against the Dartmouth Big Green. And volleyball reporter Emily Sweeney has more on the team from Burke Concord. All of some more starting on Sports Pause right now. Welcome to Sports Pause. We've got a great 30 minutes of action this week in Quinnipiac Sports. Let's move right into men's soccer. The Bobcats played against Northeastern on Tuesday. Let's roll the tape. Quinnipiac getting ready to take on the Northeastern Huskies on a hot Tuesday afternoon in Hamden. It's Northeastern jumping right to the second half. They are looking to strike first. Setting things up in front of the net. Northeastern nifty passing there, and it's going to find Kevin Ugudugu, who sends a shot on Carl Metzel. The Bobcats cannot control the rebound, and look at that. Frazier Brown finds the back of the net. One to nothing, Northeastern. Now, free kick minutes later. Netzel cannot control it out front, and right out front, Thomas Vold converts off the rebound. Two to nothing, Northeastern. Now, it's Jason Budai gets knocked down in the box. That will be called a P. K. Tomas Fekula will take it, and Fekula right down the middle nets. That one cuts the deficit in half. Two to one in favor of Northeastern. It's the final seconds now as the Bobcats are trying to force a draw in Hamden. It's going to be Budai once again trying to make things happen. The ball is going to find Alex Miller now. Miller trying to get it out front. He has Tomas Fekula again in front of the box and Spekula cannot net that one as it goes wide. Northeastern wins this one, two to one. Following the loss against Northeastern, the team took on the LaSalle Explorers in Philadelphia. The Bobcats got going early in this one. First year and reigning MAC Rookie of the Week, Francesco Ferreira scored his second goal of the season to start the match. Then grad forward Brog Austin sniped one into the net to make it 2-0 at halftime. Jason Budai tacked on another goal in the second half and the Bobcats held on to beat the Explorers 3-0. Netzel picked up his second shutout of the year and the Bobcats improved to 2-1-1. The men's soccer team announced two new assistant coach hirings today. The men's soccer team added Kamal Kaminsky and Sean O'Brien as their new assistant coaches. Kaminsky comes from FSAFC, where he was a goalie coach for two years. He also worked with Ajax Premier as the director of goalkeeping. Kaminsky played as a professional goalkeeper in Europe as well. O'Brien was an assistant coach at his alma mater SCSU for the past five seasons. Also is the head coach of Beachside Soccer Club since 2018. O'Brien also played professionally for the Elm City Express. The Bobcats will not return home until September 26th. Let's look at the road trip ahead. Welcome back to another episode of On the Pitch. I'm Keenan Mills. Alongside me is Beckett Calkins. Beckett, long road trip for the men's soccer team. They just had a game against LaSalle. Break that down for me a little bit. Big win against LaSalle in Philadelphia. Long game, multiple weather delays in that one. But they had goals from Francesco Ferreira, Brog Austin, and Jason Budai. So Bobcats have different players stepping up there, right? You've got the vet in Brog Austin. Tricky, technically skilled. He's been fantastic so far this year, especially on the ball. His touch is amazing. Then they've got guys like Francesco Ferreira right here. Former MAC Rookie of the Week already this year and just netted his second goal of the campaign. 
So, Keenan, the Bobcats have three games left on this long four-game road trip before returning home last week of September. What do they have to do to finish out this road trip strong and look ahead a little bit for us? So they're playing CCSU, they're playing Columbia, and they're playing Canisius. All of those teams only have one win on the year so far. It could be quite an easy road. A couple weeks for the Bobcats here as they might do a little sweep in non-conference play on the, this road trip before they get to Canisius to start up MAC play. I think they just need to keep doing what they're doing. They're scoring the goals. Netzel, of course, and Net, he's always going to be stopping balls. Beckett, what are you liking from this team so far? What, what's looking good for you? Well, I think we talked a little bit about it already, Keenan. I'm liking the new additions, the new first years, and the transfers that the Bobcats have brought in so far this year. We talked a little bit about Francisco Ferrer. He's not the only guy stepping out with players like Noe Cabezas and more, all providing great roles so far for the Bobcats this season. But Keenan, what could the Bobcats improve on? What hasn't been great so far for the Bobcats? So you mentioned the newcomers. They're coming in, and so it needs like a whole new program for DaCosta. He has a whole new formation, a whole new shape to his team. And you can see it from the sideline. He is yelling at them constantly. Landwagon and Austin on the same one. He's like constantly yelling at them, telling them to stay in shape. So I think they are still learning to be a team with each other. And I think with more games played, that'll just come. That's all for On the Pitch. I'm Keenan Mills. Alongside me is Becca Calkins. We'll see you next time. On Saturday, the women's soccer team traveled up to Niagara to play the Purple's Eagles. Let's see how they fared. Quinnipiac headed up to the falls for the first MAC conference game for the season against the Niagara Purple Eagles. We'll drop you off right into the first half. And the Bobcats got rolling early. Courtney Tuchel on the breakaway. Beats the Niagara defender and finds the back of the net for her second goal of the season. As you see Beckett, there was no way the defender could stop her. She was rolling. Bobcats celebrating early here, Brittany. Later in the half, crowded box off the corner kick. The ball gets rebounded away. But Michaela Baleri snipes one off the top of the bar to make it a 2-0 game. You see that goal right off the top of the crossbar, Beckett? And how about that finish? The Bobcats celebrate again, Brittany. On to the second. You think it was exciting first half. Let's see the second half. Bobcats starting to share the wealth of Victoria Foster, the junior transfer from Hartford. Nails one for her first Bobcat goal of her career. It's the first goal of the Bobcat. How exciting is that? And you'll have to see everyone getting involved early. The Bobcats go up 3-0. Bobcats keep pounding the box. A nice save by Kelsey Rodoni there, but it goes right to Molly Andrews, who scores the Bobcats' fourth goal of the game. You heard me right, Beckett. That's the fourth goal for the Bobcats. Quinnipiac holds Niagara just to five shots in the game, and the Bobcats will win 4 to nothing. This is the second shutout of the year for the Bobcats. Some members of the women's soccer team received recognition this week as well. Sofia Los Pinoso took home Defensive Player of the Week, and Courtney Choco was named Offensive Player of the Week. Los Pinoso had two shutouts this week and recorded one save against the Niagara Purple Eagles. This is the second week in a row she has won this award. Chokla had two goals and two assists, and this week scoring in back-to-back -back games. Against Stonehill, Chokla scored one goal and had two assists, and scored the first goal of the game against Niagara on Sunday. Switching to the volleyball court, two Bobcats took home awards prior to this weekend's tournament. Sophomore outside hitter Yagmir Ganesh received the MAC Player of the Week award. Ganesh had 52 points, 43 kills, and 41 digs over the weekend at the Columbia Invitational. First year outside hitter Leilani Kajusta took home the MAC Rookie of the Week award after her weekend performance, totaling 49 points, 46 kills, and 22 digs. Quinnipiac then competed in their last non-conference tournament of the year over the weekend. The Bobcats made the trip to the Henson Hawk Invitational in Maryland this weekend. They took the first game against the Gardner Webb Running Bulldogs, three sets to one. Justa led the way with 21 kills in the match. Game two against the Hampton Pirates went similarly. The Bobcats swept that one, three sets to none, behind big games from Ganesh Twins. However, Quinnipiac could not take down the host school, getting swept by the UMES Hawks in the getaway game. The Bobcats will now head home to start MAC play. We'll bump it over to volleyball analyst Emily Sweeney for more. Thanks, guys. Now, I am outside of the Recreation Center here at Quinnipiac, the home of Burt Concourt and the reigning MAC champions, the Quinnipiac Bobcats. And the volleyball team has a lot to look forward to this season. Last season, they had their first MAC championship in program history. And looking to build upon that is a team with mostly returners, the only 
big name player that they lost last year was middle blocker Nicole Leg. So they're trying to fill that spot since they don't have a clear fix for her yet in that position. But they've gone to a couple invitationals and they've tried to sort that one out. But with stars like Ariana Diaz returning and Ginevra Giovagnoni coming back with full health, this team is looking strong going into their MAC play, which is going to start this coming weekend. They have Niagara and Canisius back to back at home here at the Burt Con Court. So going into that, they did have a couple of invitationals that they've went to these past three weekends and they started off going to the Hokie Invitational. Now the Bobcats went one and two in that tournament, but a bit of a rocky start there. They versed Furman first. They lost in five sets. So the game did go the complete five sets. The Bobcats lost two to three going into this one. But Ariana Diaz and Ginevra Giovagnoni showed that they are still strong and powerful going into this season, both recording double doubles in the first matchup. Then they went on to play Virginia Tech in their second matchup of the Invitational, where the Bobcats lost zero sets to three sets. But Diaz did have eight kills and eight digs, pretty close to a double-double there. And Leglani Kaijusta, the new first-year outside hitter coming into the Bobcats this season, got her first collegiate start, and she showed some impressive numbers there as well. Now the Bobcats then went on to their second Invitational the following weekend and they traveled to Columbia for the Columbia Invitational. They played Virginia in the first game. They lost one set to three. But Damla and Yamir Ganesh both recorded double doubles in this game. The Turkish twins really balled out in this one and they did that throughout this entire Invitational. The second game against Fordham, the Bobcats did drop one to three, but they did have some shining stars. Again, the Turkish twins, Damla and Yamir got their second back to back double double of this tournament. And then the Bobcats went on to play Columbia, where they got their first win of the season in this non-conference matchup. The Bobcats won in three straight sets. Yamir got her third double-double of the season, and you really, you really saw the Bobcats coming into their own, trying to figure out this new team and the new setup they have without Nicole Legg there and with the additions of Leilani Kaijusta, trying to get her into the mix a little bit more, get her confident. Then we go into the third Invitational this past weekend. The Bobcats traveled to Henson Hawk Invitational. And this is where Leilani Kaijusta really started to come into her own. You saw her getting comfortable with the teammates and the players. And I think it's really important to note that in this game, she had a new career high in kills. She had 21 kills. She led the team in kills as well. So they're really utilizing this first year player a lot throughout this tournament. So coming out of these three invitationals, the Bobcats will start their MAC play this following weekend. They have a Saturday and Sunday home game, Niagara and then Canisius follows. Now Niagara and Canisius have not been too difficult of teams for the Bobcats, especially this last season. So it's looking good for a team who has not lost very many players and some of the other teams have lost a lot to graduation and transfers and things of that nature but I think what you really need to look at is this second half of this Bobcats schedule you're looking at Iona and Fairfield also ranked in the top three with the Bobcats in the max standings preseason poll so you're kind of looking at these matchups being the most difficult of the season Bobcats will start their play against Niagara Canisius warm up to the Iona the Fairfield and by the time they get there I think they'll have Leilani Kaijusta kind of getting into that lineup a little bit more getting more comfortable and all of the returners getting comfortable as well with their new setup without middle blocker Nicole Legg who they lost to graduation last year but they will be back at this Burkcon court right here Saturday and Sunday for their matchups against Niagara and Canisius. That's all I have for you guys. Back to the desk. Don't go anywhere. Let's see what's coming up on Sports Pause. The field hockey team took on Dartmouth on the road in a non-conference game. Nina Klein looking for her first win in that one, the Bobcats head coach. Time only tell if she gets it. And we have a rugby preview from rugby beat reporters Brianna Trackenberg and David Marr coming up. We'll be right back after this. What do you think you're doing, Kevin? I uh, was just going to drive home. Ah, uh, ah, uh, uh, there are several warning signs present that you shouldn't be driving. Like hearing voices? Like your text to emoji ratio? Oh, man, the selfies. <laughs> Selfie nailed it. We all have warning signs that let us know that we're probably not OK to drive. Mine is pretending to be your subconscious. Craig, come on, man, let's put a ride home. When we adopt a shelter pet, we discover they're a unique mix of all kinds of things. Come on, Jules, spot on this last one. Uh, there it is. He's gone with it. Leo! 
They're a little bit of a lot of things. But they're all pure love. Multiple studies have shown that marijuana can slow both driver reaction and response time, which can be really dangerous. He's here. He's here. Wait, wait, wait. What? I can't drive. But why? My. Oh. <laughs> Maybe you can make retirement happen. After all, you made home ownership happen. Homeschooling yourself on loans, beefing up your credit score. So I'm pre-approved. You were like, yes! Sorry. Color coding listings, ticking boxes, and flushing every toilet in a 20-mile radius. Home sweet home. You aced house hunting. Now get the tips you need to get on track at aceyourretirement.org. Welcome back to Sports Pause. Field hockey got their weekend started on Friday against the Dartmouth Big Green. Let's roll the tape. The Quinnipiac field hockey team traveled all the way to Dartmouth Big Green to look for their first win against Dartmouth. Head coach Nina Klein looking for her first win as the Quinnipiac head coach. Beckett, I think she's hungry for a win. All right, let's move right into the first half. Late into the second quarter, we see Quinnipiac has a penalty corner. Stella Tigmeyer in the insert pass to Olivia Howard but was deflected by the goalie, Ava Clarkson. Going into halftime, 0-0, zero, zero. but Beckett, this game gets exciting. Brown Birdie takes the ball up all the way herself, goes right to the goalie, Christina Torres, and is able to pass it right by her. Quinnipi Dartmouth will take the lead, 1-0. This is the first time Dartmouth or Quinnipiac had a lead in this game, but don't worry, let's continue watching as we see another penalty corner. We see another penalty corner. Let's see what the Bobcats will do this time. Amelia Mazzarelli. She takes the shot, it gets deflected, and Tig Myers able to put it right past the Dartmouth goalkeeper. This is Tig Myers' first goal of the season. All right, we see another penalty corner from the Bobcats. Beckett, let's see what they do this time. Mazzarelli passing it off. Mazzarelli gets the ball back again, deflected by the Dartmouth goalkeeper. Tig Myers has the ball again and is able to push the ball right past her. Tig Myers gets the second goal of the game. This gives Quinnipiac the lead. Two to one. Quinnipiac would get the win, and Nina Klein gets her first win as Quinnipiac's field hockey's head coach. On Sunday, the field hockey team was set to take on Bryant in a non conference match, but the game was delayed. The field hockey game against Bryant was postponed to Wednesday. The game was rescheduled due to thunderstorm conditions. The official called the first lightning delay around 10 minutes before the start time. They decided to reschedule the game after one hour of lightning delays. Both teams decided to move the game to 3 p.m. on Wednesday. The forecast for Wednesday calls for rain in the afternoon. Following the postponement, field hockey beat reporters Keith Savage and Ben Rickovicious previewed the Bobcats' upcoming Big East schedule. Nina Klein got her first collegiate win as a head coach this past Friday against the Dartmouth Big Green 2-1. I'm Ben Rickovicious, this is Keith Savage, and this is the Penalty Corner. Now, Keith, after the big win this past Friday, what were your overall thoughts on Quinnipiac's performance? I thought overall it was the penalty corners. Both the goals came off penalty corners by Stella Timmeyer. One, the first one was a really good design play as Timmeyer was passing out and got the ball right back to score right from the net. And the second one is just the ball bounced around and found Timmeyer. But overall, that's what impressed me the most the penalty corners. That defense, really young defense. Talk more about first year Katie Shanahan later in her role. But Torres had a good game, and overall, I was impressed by that game, and I'm looking forward to the future. Now, with the cancellation of the game against Bryant on Sunday, that will be now moved to Wednesday, so the Bobcats will have three games in five days, including their first two Big East opponents. Keith, what are your predictions for this upcoming stretch? I think the cardio is really going to have to be shown in, these ne in this next week in general, with three games, two of them being at home, and one on Wednesday and Sunday, and away at Providence. But you need to be Providence and Nova, or at least go 1-1. If you go 2-0, all of a sudden, you're really in that chase to make that Big East fourth playoff spot. But if you go 0-2, you could put an argument that the season's already basically over if they lose both games. But I believe they'll go 1-1. and I think they'll beat Providence and lose to Nova, but I think it could be a close game, like a 3-2. But I wouldn't be absolutely shocked if they went 2-0, but I predict them going 1-1 with a win on Prov at Providence on Friday and a loss Sunday 
at Villanova. So Keith, we got to witness the two to one loss against UMass a couple weeks ago. Anybody in that game that impressed you? Yeah, it's been first year Katie Shanahan. She's playing a difficult role on the defensive side. And overall, you don't see a lot of first years play for the Bobcats. The only ones that have done it were Emilia Mazzarelli, uh, Christina Torres, Lucia Pompeo, all players who still have a big impact on this team. So already seeing her first year in Katie Shanahan being a starter, she's something who's really impressed me at taking over the Eva Veltor's role from last season. So overall, I'm, I like to see how her growth is throughout this year. And for the future, she's going to be really great. But I want to see how it is this year because, again, they can make the Big East playoffs for the first time ever. So I'm curious to see how that looks. Well, we'll have to see how they end up performing for this upcoming stretch. Their next game will be against Bryant, the cancellation game, at 3 p.m. Wednesday afternoon. I'm Ben Rickovicious alongside Keith Savage, and that was the Penalty Corner. After getting rained out this weekend, the rugby team has a busy schedule ahead. Rugby beat reporters Brianna Trachtenberg and David Marr have more. After this week's game against LIU being postponed, the Quinnipiac rugby team will take on Navy next week. David, what are your thoughts about the game coming up? Yeah, it's a big game for Quinnipiac. Obviously, they didn't get to play last week against LIU, so now the challenge steps forward this week against Navy. Now, the Bobcats did take a big loss in week one against Harvard, but that was because Coach Becky Carlson wanted to break in a new game plan. And it's not going to work right away week one, especially on offense. We saw the Bobcats really miscommunicate, turn the ball over too much. And it obviously completely fell apart in a flash for the Bobcats. Now going into week uh, three against Navy after an extra week to prepare, hopefully they've got their offensive issues figured out because I still do believe in Becky Carlson. She is a great head coach, and she, she's going to have her team ready to play this week against Navy. What do you think is the biggest adjustment that Quinnipiac needs to make in order to get their offense to work? I think it just comes back to doing the little things right. They've committed way too many knocks, especially when they got close to the try zone last week against Harvard. Way too many, you know, drop balls and too many missed opportunities to score against Harvard. They had a chance to punch in a try before the end of the first half and didn't get it done. They had a chance to score on a what looked like a walk-in try for the Bobcats. Ball comes out, ends up being a knock. They turn the ball over. Harvard goes the other way and scores. But it all comes down to communication and ball security for the Bobcats against Navy. Offense has to come through if they're going to beat Navy. Because the Bobcats defense did whatever they could to hold down a really good Harvard team. But offensively, they have got to communicate and they've got to stop making the mistakes. So now, last time that the Bobcats played Navy was in 2014. And Navy, the two other games that they've had were not teams that we play usually in the regular season. Without a lot of knowledge, how do you think the Bobcats are coming in to prepare for Navy, and what do they need to know for this game? I think that Navy's a pretty balanced team. We've seen the first couple of weeks. They didn't win week one, but they resolved a lot of issues, especially on offense against Westchester to get a big win, 38-3. to So they're going to come in a little bit uh, confident, but the Bobcats, extra week to prepare, extra week to understand Carlson's offensive system that she wants to break in. So that's a big opportunity for the Bobcats to see if that extra week of preparation has paid off. Because, we, again, like you talked about, we don't know much about Navy. They've played two teams the Bobcats aren't familiar with. And after a 10-year hiatus between these two teams, we get to see it on the field. But we really do get to see if the Bobcats have fixed their offensive issues that they had last week. Who do you think is going to be a key player next week against Navy? I think there's two players to keep an eye on. Kat Story led the team in scoring last year. She didn't get on the board in week one against Harvard, but she's still a very shifty player. As a, much of her teammates talked about her last year, she's a shifty player. Her speed and agility on the perimeter is a big factor in the Bobcats' offense. They like to get her out in space when she's got the ball. She's a very shifty player. She looks to, she'll look, be looking to get on the board for the first time this season against Navy. The other player to keep in mind, Alexandra Ertolino. I thought she had a really great game against Harvard. She was so close to getting a try to end the half against the Crimson last week. Very close, but she did a really good job pile driving uh, the Crimson defense last week. I think those two players are going to have a big impact on this game against Navy next week. We've been through a ton of news, but there's still more to come. Beckett, we still have to cover men's basketball signings like Jacob Ragoni. And we also have top five plays of the week. Brittany, I hear there's something magical coming in the air in Hamden. I don't think that many kids in my son's school even do it. He makes fun of his friend who vapes. He would never try it. She's in the 
just off. She's on the honor roll. She's just off the tape. No way. No way. No way. No way. My kid would never vape. Get your head out of the cloud. Today, nearly 8,000 kids will start vaping. Maybe even yours. Learn about the dangers at talkaboutvaping.org. I think it's just vapor with flavor. It won't hurt my kid like cigarettes, right? Vaping is safer than smoking, isn't it? There's really not even that much nicotine in them, right? My kid? My kid knows it's dangerous. Get your head out of the cloud. Today, nearly 8,000 kids will start vaping, maybe even yours. Learn about the dangers at talkaboutvaping.org. Meet the scan, a simple procedure whose mission is to detect lung cancer early. I'm here to save you! But I feel fine. That's great, but you may still be at high risk for lung cancer. Oh man, that's a new fence. If you smoke, early detection could save your life. Learn more at SaveByTheScan.org. Type 2 diabetes can have a big impact on your life, but how can it be prevented? Well, the first step is knowing if you have prediabetes, a serious medical condition that puts you at high risk for type 2 diabetes. One in three American adults has prediabetes, but more than 80% don't know they have it. The good news is, prediabetes can be reversed, and for many people, healthy changes in their daily routine can make a big difference. Take the one-minute risk test today at doihaveprediabetes.org. Thanks for sticking with us. Now, switching to the court, the men's basketball team had three former players sign professional deals this week. Aaron Falzone, who played with the Bobcats during the 2019-2020 season after transferring from Northwestern, signed with the Kagawa Five Arrows of the Japanese B-League. Jacob Rigoni, who spent five years with the Bobcats from 2017 to 2022, has signed with the Adelaide 36ers of the NBL. The 2024 season, Ike Nweke, who played his loan season with the Bobcats last year after transferring from Columbia University, has signed with Yost United in the Netherlands. Hey Beckett, I think it's time for a little magic. You know what time it is, Beckett? It's the most magical time of the night, Brittany. Time for Top 5. Quinnipiac, down 2-0 against Northeastern, but it's Tomas Vekula sending that one past Gregor Shaw for the Bobcats' lone goal of the game. Quinnipiac lost 2-1. All right, time for play number four. Now jumping over to field hockey, the Bobcats are down 1-0. But don't you worry, Amelia Mazzarelli gets the ball off the penalty corner and passes to Stella Tigmeyer, and she will make it tie the game 1-1. And I hear this was a game of first for the Bobcats. Nina Klein's first win. Let's stay on field hockey now. It's Amelia Mazzarelli gets the ball off the penalty corner. She's going to try and send that one to the back of the goal, but is blocked by the Dartmouth goalie. Tittmeyer, though, is right there for the rebound, sends that one through. 2-1 lead for the Bobcats, who ended up winning this one. First win for Nina Klein. Let's go to play number two. Switching over to women's soccer, at the end of the first half, Markayla Valeri gets the ball off a Quinnipiac corner and sends the shot off the crossbar and into the back of the net. Quinnipiac extends the lead 2-0, but Becca, guess what? They win this game 4-0. And look at the celebration, Brittany. Let's go to men's soccer now. The ball here is going to pop up into the air. Look at that, but Quinnipiac regains the possession and the transfer, Noe Cabezas, passes the ball over to Brog Austin, the grad student. He's going to kick that shot into the lower corner. Two to nothing, Bobcats, as they score that one and win this game three to nothing. Brittany, what was your favorite play? I was going to ask you that question. My favorite play would have to be Tigmeyer's second goal of the game to give the Bobcats a lead against Dartmouth. That was their first home game a win. That was Luna Klein's first game. How could that not be play number one? And that's just great fight there from Tittmeyer. She stayed with that one and ended up really winning the Bobcats the game. What was your favorite play? I have to go with Brog Austin's nifty finish there for the men's soccer team. They're on a little bit of a hot stretch here. See what they can do going forward on this road trip. But that's all the time we have for tonight. Make sure to follow us on X at Q30 Sports and on Instagram at Q30 Television. Thank you to everyone behind the scenes who made the show possible. For Becca Calkins, I'm Brittany Brown-Liebman. Good night, Bobcats.